there. My name is Ilani Casey. I'm an enrolled tribal member of the Tlingit Nation Raven Frog Clan, born and raised in Seattle. I'm the board chair of the Nakani Native Program, and Nakani is a Tlingit word that means go between. And we are a 501c3. We've been around between three and four years, and we're very happy to have the Stand Up to Oil uh, grant to do this work. And I will do a very brief welcoming song. Ganeshjeesh, thank you, Ganeshjeesh. And now we have Lindsay Crowfoot. Thank you. Hi, thank you. Thank you, Nakani Native Program, for having me here today. I'm really excited. Um, like Imani said, my name is Lindsay Crowfoot. I am a Clinkate Enrolled Tribal member. I'm Hootsnuwu Kwan Deshi Tan, um, which is Fortress of the Brown Bear Tribe and uh, Beaver Clan. I'm also a Colville descendant, and I am a Native Environmental scientist and indigenous educator who currently works at Northwest Indian College on the Tulalip Reservation in one of their small satellite campuses. I graduated from there with my Bachelor's of Science in Native Environmental Science in 2016 and then I was invited back to teach there in 2017. I teach cultural sovereignty and natural sciences there um, and have been doing that since then. I'm also a full-time graduate student at the University of Idaho. I'm pursuing my master's degree in natural resources. I'm about halfway through now. Actually, I just finished my uh, half, got to my halfway mark. So one year left and I'll have that degree. I'm also a mom of three. I have a 22-year-old daughter. I have a 16, 16-year-old 16 son. And then I have a little four-year-old also. So I'm a pretty busy uh, mom, um, working and, and teaching and all of that. Um, so what you're gonna be learning today is what is tribal sovereignty, or more specifically, what is food sovereignty? Uh, what, the tr what was the traditional diet pre-contact? And then what are some historic and current barriers to accessing our traditional foods and, and our ability to revitalize our food culture? Uh, we'll also be kind of looking more specifically at a few plants, just doing a highlight of like three or four native plants, how they were harvested, when, how to identify them, and what they were used for. And then we'll take a short break and transition over into doing a quick demonstration on how to use some of the uh, medicines that are gathered and, and we'll do a, um, make some salves as a little demonstration. So I'm going to share my screen with you guys so you guys can see my presentation. If you guys will give me the thumbs up that everybody can see, that would be great. Awesome. All right. So here today, my presentation is on Pacific Northwest traditional foods and medicines. Like I said, cultural sovereignty and barriers to revitalization. And this is for the Nakani Native program today. Click. Here we go, sorry about that. Okay, so what is tribal food sovereignty? So tribal food sovereignty is the right for indigenous nations to define their own diets and shape what food systems are congruent with their spiritual and cultural values. So food sovereignty really is cultural sovereignty because all of the way that we used to live was wrapped around our foods and our access to those foods. Communities that exhibit tribal food sovereignty are those that have access to healthy food, have foods that are culturally appropriate, they grow, gather, hunt, and fish in ways that are maintainable over the long term. They're able to distribute foods in a way so that people get what they need to stay healthy. They adequately compensate the people who provide those foods and they utilize tribal treaties and uphold policies to ensure continued access to traditional foods. So what it, what it used to be like, what was our diet and how did we live pre-contact? So native people have lived in reciprocity with this land since time immemorial. 
we lived through subsistence. We were living with and off the land to survive. And we did this with hunting, fishing, gathering, and agriculture. So for native tribes, life and time was about the food. Everything that we did around the year was around what was available for harvest, when it was the most nutritious. So much so that in the Lachute seed calendar, about the moons of the year, seven months are describing food availability. So here's an example. There are several, there's northern Lachute there's several dialects, and so there are a little bit of variations of this calendar, but here's one of the Lachute seed calendars of the, of the months of the year. And this is listed in 12 months, but really there's 13 moons, so there's a little bit of a discrepancy, but generally these seasons were around these times. So in January, it was known as when your stomach sticks to your back, Bone, and that's indicating that there really wasn't a lot of food available during that time. Uh, so February is the windy time, March is when the frogs sing, April is when you hear the voices of the migrating cranes and swans, May is the time to dig roots, June was sa is salmon berry season, July is blackberry season, August is salal berry season, September is the return of the coho, November many is when there's many leaves falling, and then November is when the chum return, and December, that winter time, is time to sheathe the paddles. Shorelines, rivers, prairies, forests, and mountain slopes were rich with resources provided by the spirits so that people might live. Movement of the people was based on the food supplies in those ecosystems. The winter was the end of the fishing cycle and kind of when everything began again. In spring, canoe carving was done, like I mentioned, root digging was done in the calendar, and fishing was starting up during this time again. In the summer, there was berry gathering and fishing, and in the fall, there was fishing and root digging. Hold on here, sorry, I lost my view of you guys. There we go, okay. So people connected, their, their culture was connected to food and place. Tribes traveled between temporary and established camps. These camps were considered sacred places. So in the winter time, most people went to established longhouses, and in the summer, they had temporary camps, spring, summer, and fall, they had temporary camps that followed the fish and the harvest. Some of the camps that have been, I, permanent camps that have been identified in the area are Hibol, which is a Snohomish village that's now where, that is where Legion Park in Everett is today. There's Duskokum, which is Squamish, where Port Madison is today. Hoko was a Sklalem and Okino village at the mouth of the Okiho River on the Strait of Juan de Fuca, and Hatatlich, it was a Lummi village on the southeast end of Orcas Island. Each camp provided different resources, and these resources were vital to keeping people healthy, both physically and spiritually. Routes between camps provided food and access to water resources. And it was a way of life that both sustained the people and created rich culture. Here I brought up a map of all of the documented permanent winter longhouses around Puget Sound. You can see there's hundreds of them. I, I, I haven't actually counted them, but I would guess it looks like there's close to hundreds of them. So they were all around Puget Sound area. And these are just the permanent villages. This does not, is not documenting the temporary camps that were all throughout Indian Country and Puget Sound. And then here I just have a picture of what a traditional longhouse might look like. This is the Clatsop longhouse that's down on the Columbia River. So natives honored the land, the water, the animals, and the plants as gifts from the creator. These gifts were respected and treasured, and we were never wasteful of the gifts that were provided. Respect and honor of the reciprocal relationship was shown in many ways through ceremonies and developed protocols, songs and prayers, dances, stories, and the arts. 
some of the ceremonies that people have heard of, or most people have heard of the first salmon ceremony, but we also had sunflower ceremonies and huckleberry ceremonies, and many of them are still being practiced today. Archaeology shows us that our ancestors had a diverse traditional diet along with oral history. Our ancestors were healthy people that harvested and processed a great diversity of food. The Puget Sound Traditional Foods and Diabetes Project did a study and did research of what foods were eaten by our ancestors. This was headed up by Hank Govan of the Tulalip Tribes, but did include some other organizations. What they did is they evaluated 31 dig sites and studied all of the more organic material and bones in the layers, and they were able to identify 170 species of plants and animals. On the left, you'll see a picture here. These are shell middens. And what a shell midden is, if you aren't aware, is at a, an encampment where food was either being eaten regularly or processed regularly, the shells would be discarded into piles. And over time, there would be these layers of piles that actually give us a history of what the diet was, what was being eaten during what season or what year something was harvested more than the other, maybe indicating availability. Um, and so these shell middens are used um, through archaeological study to identify what foods are eaten. One particular um, dig was done on Vashon Island at Quartermaster Harbor. If you look down here in the map on the right hand, this is Vashon Island and Quartermaster Harbor is right here kind of in this point area that crooks into the little neck of the bay there. And so in 1996, they did this dig. It was a collaborative effort by the Puyallup Tribe, the Burke Museum of Natural History and Culture, King County, and McMurray Middle School. It was a study of shell middens in a 14-day exca excavation. And there they found 9,000 fish bones from 20 different kinds of fish, but most of them were herring bones. They also found flounder, perch, cod, sculpin, skate, and other fishes. The site was actually interpreted as a fish and shellfish processing camp where people once took advantage of the windy spot on the Quartermaster Harbor to dry herring. This was a fish processing area. So oral tradition tells us what plants we ate. Um, Northwest Coast Indians ate a great diversity of foods, including a great diversity of plants, but our, these studies don't accurately represent what plant foods are eaten because plant remains deteriorate much more quickly than animal bones. So stories passed down through the generations oral or our oral traditions tell us that berries, roots, bulbs, nuts, and seeds were really important parts of the traditional diet. Archaeological sites around Puget Sound have found more than 280 plants, birds, mammals, fish, reptiles, shellfish, and other marine life um, as our traditional foods. And then testimony and knowledge from Coast Salish elders, hunters, fishermen, and gatherers has confirmed those and added many more to the list. So on this slide, you'll see that compiled list that was done of all of the traditional foods, those both identified through archaeological archaeological digs, and then those from oral tradition from our elders and our um, hunters and gatherers. And so this is 300, nearly 300 um, native plants, birds, mammals, reptiles, and shellfish that, that we eat here ate here in the Pacific Northwest. You can find this list if you want to look at it a little more closely on the Burke Museum website in their um, cultural sovereignty and food sovereignty section. All right, so now we've kind of got into the background of what it was like before, what we ate before, and now we're going to start getting into kind of the barriers to accessing and how we lost the ability to access our traditional foods. So one, uh, the treatment, excuse me, the Stevens treaties uh, were done in between 1854 and 1856. And during this time, five treaties done by Governor Isaac Stevens um, removed most of the Washington tribes onto reservations. There were some tribes who did not treaty and then were then removed by executive order. And the, these tribes do have some um, 
fishing, gathering, and hunting rights guaranteed to them through their executive orders. During the treaty process, um, tribal leaders fought to maintain certain rights on lands outside of the reservations. Specifically, they fought to retain the sovereign right to fish, hunt, and gather at usual and accustomed stations in exchange for their lands outside of the reservation. While that was guaranteed in the treaties, those promises were quickly broken in the decades that followed and tribes were systematically denied their treaty protected rights by the federal and state governments. So here we have a map of Washington Territory in 1854 on the top and the land holdings of the Salish people here in Washington. And you can see kind of the, um, the boundaries, the rough boundaries that were in place at the time. And then the second map is 1890 and that is where the reservation borders and so that's where the indians became we became confined to here in washington state well this map actually expands washington state but you can see washington here <laughs> so here's what we have currently if if we were able to view these side by side the two slides what you would see is that we actually have a higher number of reservations now um, than we did then. Um, they, some people have been able to get their own land and have their own reservation where they were um, kind of lumped together with other tribes before. And then also one kind of glaring one, I guess for me, because I'm Colville descendant, is that Colville Reservation is half uh, the size currently than it was um, in the 1890 uh, map. So what were the consequences of these unkept promises? Um, life on the reservation changed everything for Native American people. There was competition for natural resources and these led to infringement on Indian rights. As resources diminished, access to traditional foods declined drastically. There were less fish and native foods available to Indian people. And despite the promises, Indians were confined to the reservation. In the early years, they could be shot at for leaving the reservation, and then the later years, they could be arrested if they didn't have permission to leave without, if they didn't have permission from the Indian agent to leave the reservation. This completely disrupted the traditional way of life. No longer were they able to travel where the food was and move with the seasons, access these temporary camps or the paths that they used to travel between them that had all of their food sources and their water resources. So there was not enough food on the reservation. The tribes were traveling great distances to gather the food that they needed and being confined to the reservation limited that. The resources were not available on the reservation because oftentimes the places that the Indians were given to stay were inhospitable. They were, and they needed to be cleared to create food. Um, so what happened is a lot of natives tr transitioned to being wage workers. They became hops pickers, uh, berry pickers, things like that. The men became loggers, worked in logging camps. Um, so there was a transition from being a subsist living a subsistence lifestyle and traveling with the seasons and with your foods to being wage workers. Oppression, oppression and assimilation just re completely reshaped the Indian diet. Traditional lifeways were quickly banned on reservations to assimilate people to the Western lifestyle. Children were taken away from reservations to attend boarding schools to civilize them, and generations suffered as their traditional way of life almost vanished. Children were not able to learn their traditional ways from their elders, their parents, their aunties, and their uncles. They weren't learning the routes that these foods were on. They weren't learning the traditional names or the traditional uses of these foods. <clears throat> and they were being fed a Western diet in the boarding schools in the, during the school year. And then when they came home during the summer, they, they were feed, eating commodity foods. The health ramifications of being separated from traditional foods and lifeways could be seen almost immediately. The Western diet is high in starches, refined sugars, unhealthy fats, and is not fit for Native people. 
obesity, diabetes, and heart disease increased rapidly in Indi Indian communities, and mental health issues increased as well. We saw an increase in substance abuse disorder, and we've seen increases, increased rates in suicide. Pictured here on this slide, you'll see the vast difference between the traditional diet and the modern diet. I love to show this example because really what we're seeing on the right hand side here is just kind of what your average person might meet, eat at like a lunch. Um, and so you're, you're taking you have a one hour, maybe even a half an hour break at lunch for work and you've got to just run out and get something. Unless you're somebody who's really diligent about packing your lunch every day and making sure it's healthy, there are people out there doing that for sure, but that's not the vast majority of America or Native America because of access. And so we run out and we get a pizza. Oh, excuse me, I'm sorry, I've got a toddler coming in. Meet my four-year-old, sorry about that. <laughs> And um, so you run out and you go and you get your lunch and you grab a burger, you get a slice of pizza, a soda, maybe you brought, home, brought some leftover macaroni and cheese from lunch the other day, um, or, or you think you make this healthy choice, this sandwich, and, but really what we're looking at here is, you know, refined sugars and starches and it really isn't that healthy. And we see the traditional diet on the left and we've got all of these colors. We've got, you know, our purples, which have our like riboflavins. We have our protein in our nettle. We have our good fats in our, um, in our salmon. And so we have this diversity of color and diversity of vitamins and minerals and proteins that are just in that, built into that traditional way of life. <clears throat> We are the salmon people. Being separated from those salmon had detrimental effects. And as state fishing departments began to regulate fishing, Native American sovereign rights to fish were denied. Many natives were assaulted, arrested, and fined for fishing within their usual and accustomed fishing areas. Fishing is not a right that was given to us by the treaties. It's important to recognize that fishing and gathering and our relationship with the land and the animal people, this is an unalienable right that was given to us by the Creator. Now it's guaranteed in the treaty, but this is not something that was bestowed upon us. This was something that our ancestors, our elders, worked really hard to retain a right that would, had been given to us by the Creator. Despite this, conflicts between white fishermen and Native American fishermen have persisted, have persisted into today, but really persisted for over a century um, over access to fishing grounds off of the reservation and catch allocations. So this culminated in the Pacific Northwest Fish Wars of the 1960s and the 1970s. So in 1974, well, the finding was in 1974, but the United States sued the state of Washington over their mistreatment of natives and their ability to access their fish <clears throat> because they were not honoring the treaties. The state had tried to limit Native American fishing. Judge George Hugo Bolt upheld the treaties. He ruled that based on the language of the treaty and how it would have been interpreted at the time by the people who signed it, that there had been this guarantee of 50% of the catch. The terminology that's used in the treaty is that it was in common, that the fish should be held in common. Um, common being 50-50 is how Judge George Bolt interpreted it. This opened a pathway to restoring food sovereignty. Salmon was the traditional fight that the food was framed around, but the right, <clears throat> the right to access usual and accustomed areas and practice cultural sovereignty was at the heart of the issue. The Bolt decision not only affirmed many tribes' treaty rights to fish, it also guaranteed access to those usual and accustomed grounds outside of their reservations. Oh, sorry, gotta go back. I don't know what happened there. Access to natural resources provides opportunities to protect sovereign rights for cultural revitalization. Tribal members can exercise their rights and practice traditional food sovereignty through hunting, fishing, and gathering now that they are not confined to the reservation. 
The Judge George Bolt decision also spurred natural resource departments being funded within tribal governments. And these resources, they manage commercial fishing, aquaculture, fish hatcheries, forestry and game, game management. They manage and oversee the natural resources. And these natural resources feed their people and provide economic security for the tribes and for their members. So these tribes with their natural resource departments, they operate as co-managers of the hunting, fishing, and gathering areas along with state and federal natural resource and or fish and game departments. They work to protect their 50% of allowable take. They protect and enhance tribal natural resources through land access issues, ecosystem protection, and restoration projects. They help set and regulate both commercial and recreational harvests. And they help create guidelines for lowest impact techniques and incorporate traditional ecological knowledge into land management practices. The pictures on the right you'll see are two uh, restoration projects by local tribes. The top one is the Quilute Estuary Restoration Project done um, with the by the Tulalip Tribes Natural Resource Department in partnership with Snohomish County and a couple of other organizations. I had the opportunity in, in my undergraduate work to intern in the restoration department and work on this particular project, which restored over 300 acres of estuary to the lower Snohomish, um, to the lower Snohomish estuary by doing some levee removal that had been put in the early 1900s um, to drain out the estuary in order to bring in farming. And on the bottom we have the Elwha River Dam removal, another example of a restoration project that was done by a local tribe using their treaty rights to protect their natural resources. So we've talked about the historical barriers to traditional foods removal from our lands, <clears throat> assimilation and oppression. And then um, finally, we kind of have gotten to this point where we're revitalizing. We've got these natural resource departments that are working to secure our access, but we're still finding today that there are barriers to our traditional foods and medicines. Native people continue to fight for their right to access their traditional foods in their usual and accustomed areas. There are many barriers remaining. Those include colonization, which is ongoing, loss of land, destruction of ecosystems, and toxins in the environment. So colonization has been detrimental to our ability to access our traditional foods because it has removed us from our traditional life ways. It's disrupted the seasonal travel and gathering and it's removed us from the ecosystem structure and function. We're disconnected from our place and the traditional natural resources. Through colonization, we've transitioned from sustaining, from living that sustainable lifestyle, hunter-gatherers to wage workers. And that separation over time has resulted in a huge loss of traditional eco ecological knowledge. Like I mentioned before, the boarding school era was especially detrimental to our ability to revitalize even today um, our cultural food practices because the children were taken to these boarding schools and they didn't learn and they were not able to pass that on to their children. They were fed that colonized diet and became accustomed and they fed that colonized diet to their children who were then accustomed. The new colonized norms were passed down to subsequent generations and reinforced. Urbanization is another colonizing um, aspect of the barriers. Many Indians are living in cities now, away from their lands, away from the reservations, and away from natural resources that they have access to. As resources on tribal lands dwindled, many natives sought employment in cities. Policies meant to further, further separate native people from their culture and, and lands encouraged and funded relocation to cities. By, 2000, by the 2010 census, the percentage of urban native people had grown to 71%. 
separated from their people and their lands, separated, excuse me, from their people and their lands where their rights are legally established, they have few opportunities to practice food sovereignty outside of state regulations. So this one actually hits home really for me because I'm a Clinket tribal member and I'm a Colville descendant, I do not have any hunting, gathering, or fishing rights, any of my traditional hunting, fishing, or gathering rights down here in Washington state. I'm removed from my native lands. These are other people's usual and accustomed areas. And so I am limited to harvesting only based on state regulation. Loss of land has been detrimental as well. Treaties drastically reduced Indian land access, like you saw in those maps. Ongoing leg legislation and Indian policy after the treaties continued to decrease access on and off the reservation. In particular, the General Allotment Act of 1887 was extremely detrimental because it broke the integrity of the reservation. Prior to 1887, all of the land within the reservation's border belonged to the tribe. After 1887, the reservations were broken up into lots. Those lots were assigned to tribal members or they were able to pick. It kind of depended how it worked out with your Indian agent. And the land that was left over was sold uh, to white settlers. So this resulted in checkerboarding of the reservations. And this has happened all over North America. Um, there's checkerboarding of all of the reservations. And so what we have here on the left on the bottom is a map of the 1885, or excuse me, what does it say there? 1883, when there's the lots, allotments were done on Tulalip. And you can see all of those allotments are Indian land holdings. And then on the right hand side we have 2004 and that is pretty much the most current um, land ownership by tribal members or the tribe on the Tulalip Reservation. So the green is what the tribe or tribal members own and the tan color are non-tribal community members that own land on the Tulalip Reservation. So this checkerboarding means that you have no access. And, if, and even if you do have two points of access that you own, you may not be able to travel between them effectively because somebody else owns that land in between. Ecosystem destruction. So ecosystem destruction has just really increased in the last few centuries and it has been detrimental to our ability to revitalize our food culture and access our traditional foods and medicines. Removal of the indigenous people of the land that they have lived in re reciprocity within is ecosystem destruction because we are a living, breathing part of the whole ecosystem. Our removal from the land is ecosystem disruption and destruction. We played an important role in the structure and function of the natural Pacific Northwest ecosystem. We propagated plants, we pruned plants, we thinned them, we kept healthy deer populations, by hunting them, we kept healthy fish populations by treating them with our with respect with our protocols and never taking any more than what we need. We were an integrated and integral part of that system and our removal in itself is ecosystem destruction. Aside from our removal from the system, urban and agricultural development has resulted in wide set spread ecosystem destruction in the Pacific Northwest. Western practices are much different from native practices and when settlers came into the area they cleared forests, they drained wetlands, they diked estuaries, they straightened streams and rivers and installed bulkheads on our shorelines. Urban, developed has urban development has increased toxins in the environment and toxins are probably and have been identified by many indigenous groups that have um, spoke on this. Maybe the biggest barrier that we have to accessing all of our traditional foods and medicine. Specifically, urban development has um, 
increased runoff into our waterways. This is increasing nutrients. We find pharmaceuticals in our waterways and we have increased sediments in the stream. So what does this do? Increased nutrients throw off the balance of our water. We could have toxic algal blooms. Um, some of these, those toxic algal, algal blooms can then rob the oxygen of the water and without any oxygen in that water, all of the fish can die, all of the benthic invertebrates that are kind of on the floor of that area can die. Um, so increased nutrients is a huge issue um, from urban runoff and that could be from fertilizers that in, in people's lawns and all sorts of different things. Um, pharmaceuticals, so the, I had read a study that some of the pharmaceuticals were really doing some damage to some of our frogs. Amphibians are especially um, sensitive to some of the pharmaceuticals that are making their way into the Salish Sea, Puget Sound area. And increased sediments into the stream, we have impervious surfaces now, and so when it rains, like all the grit and the grime just can run off into the stream. And that grit and grime and those sediments would, can actually like be like sandpaper on our baby salmon's skin. And it can cause some real problems with our salmon populations. So agriculture and industrial chemicals are a real big problem as well. They introduce heavy metals into the environment, which can be taken up by plants. We can find those in the water. They're in a lot of our <clears throat> shellfish because our shellfish are bottom feeders and those things kind of tend to settle in that uh, benthic layer right at the bottom of, at the top layer of the ocean floor. And they, they filter that in and they accumulate it in their bodies. And then we can ingest that and become sick. An example of this happening actually is up in Bellingham Bay. Uh, there was a paper mill that was in, I think I wanna say early 1900s to the 50s that had dumped a bunch of mercury into Bellingham Bay and it took years and years and years to clean it up. But I, I believe it's still an ongoing process. They also introduced pesticides and herbicides and those are again detrimental to life, whether that be uh, plants or animals ourselves. Um, and it's, these are all unhealthy for plants, animals, and people. And these heavy metals, pesticides, herbicides, pharmaceuticals, nutrients, all of these things can increase in concentration the higher up the food chain. So that means if a plant takes it in and then a small animal eats it and then a bigger animal eats it, as we move up the chain, those toxins become more concentrated and since we're kind of high up on that food chain we actually can be will be eating things that can have very high concentrations of these toxins so toxins encompasses the fossil fuel economy and climate change fossil fuels introduce toxins into our atmosphere Yes, these, uh, some of these toxins are already present and it's really about the level, but they are toxins because of the way that they affect us. So the fossil fuel economy has induced climate change and this may be the strongest barrier. Global carbon emissions from fossil fuels have significantly increased since 1900. I think most people know that by now. Um, but since 1970 in particular, carbon dioxide emissions have increased by about 90%. With emissions from fossil fuel combustion and industrial processes alone contributing about 78% of the total greenhouse gas emissions between 1970 and 2011. Agriculture, deforestation, and other land use changes have also been large contributors to our increase in carbon dioxide. Because trees sequestered carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere, the less trees that we have, the less natural filtering system we have. So deforestation decreases nature's ability to keep the atmosphere in balance. And this is why we, one of the reasons why we see the rising levels. Carbon dioxide and methane and some of the other um, heat trapping greenhouse gases that are put out through the combustion of fossil fuels for industry and transportation have always, these, these chemicals have always been present in our atmosphere. But human influences have increased the amount drastically, like I said, over the last century. And that's because we are 
reliant on a fossil fuel economy for our transportation, our industry, and our electricity generation. Now here in the Pacific Northwest, the electricity generation may not be as big of a problem as far as the fossil fuel goes, but if we look on the other side of that, our clean hydro energy has been detrimental to Native people and their access to salmon, specifically along the big rivers such as the Columbia. <clears throat> So these fossil fuels create the greenhouse gases that trap heat in the atmosphere. And this has led to rising temperatures, loss of, oh, loss of glaciers, sea level <laughs> rise, and shortened rainy seasons. We've seen acid rain events and acidification of our ocean waters, and our weather is getting more severe in some areas. Climate change threatens the stability of the health that the stability of the health of natural resources that supply support our food sovereignty. Plants and animal species of the Pacific Northwest evolved over time with our regional climate. Many species will not be able to adapt to the rapid changes in temperature and precipitation patterns. Rising sea levels will displace native people <clears throat> from more of their traditional lands and displace important shoreline species. Acid rain and acid acidification of the ocean waters damages traditional plants and foods and creates unhealthy conditions for our sea life that we've been reliant on since time immemorial. One of the biggest barriers that we have faced is also the colonization of our plant and animal relatives themselves. Our animal and plant relatives have faced colonization by being tamed, the taming of the wild lands, for selection for human use. Today, when we look out at the forest, what we see is Douglas fir, a beautiful monocrop of Douglas fir, but we had this beautiful, diverse forest canopy pre-contact. Selection for human use has changed the entire ecosystem and landscape. The introduction of exotic species have been destructive um, and they outcompete for resources with our native uh, plants a lot of the time. The introduction of pathogens that native species have no defense to have also uh, something our plant relatives have faced. The extinction of family groups. Reduced ranges due to land loss, ecosystem destruction, and toxins in the environment. One of my favorite quotes from an indigenous educator, Muckleshoot indigenous educator, that I believe is doing a presentation for the Nakani Native Program on Friday, Valerie Seagrest, in her TED Talk, she mentions that food upholding its right to practice culture. And that little quote was just really profound to me and it really made me want to highlight that our plant people have been really also hurt by history. So how do we take it back? So now we have this access and, and we have some barriers, but what, what can we do? The first thing we need to do is use our rights. We need to go to the places we do have access to and we need to hunt and we need to fish and we need to gather and we need to garden. As tribal people, we need to reinforce our own and our tribe's connection to culture, to our place and to our foods. We need to teach our children to not just appreciate nature from far. We need to make them a part of nature by spending time with it. We need to let them develop intimate relationships with the plant people and animal people. We need to participate in education programs. Educate yourself. And then how to honor traditional foods and medicines as guests on this land. Honor foods of the original people of the land by treating the land and all its inhabitants as gifts. Only harvest during of the appropriate season and never take more than you will use. Harvest in a sustainable and ethical way.
Okay, so there's the, I'm a college professor portion of my uh, presentation. Uh, let me get you guys up here big again. Okay, um, this slide here is really just a snapshot of the things that I harvest with my students, with my family, just by myself. Um, let me get this, let you guys get in my way here. So some of the things that are here, I also have on a table behind me. I'm gonna kind of go through some of the things I harvest and during the season of them. Um, I'm hoping, yeah, you guys can see okay. So here I have just kind of some jars of some things. I just wanted to highlight a couple of different plants that I harvest throughout the season. And I'm going to start with spring just because we're in the spring, kind of what's going right now. Um, one thing that I'm going to bring out here is this one here is our native orange honeysuckle. This makes an amazing tea. I'm not going to go into the uses on this stuff because I have some other plants, but this one's just coming into season right now and this is a nice spring harvest. I'm going to try and show a diversity. So this one is a seaweed. This is another one that's kind of coming up into season here. And this one is called splendid iridescent seaweed. And this would have been used in like soups and stews. It's a good thickener. Um, so you don't have, you know, we don't have potatoes. Well, we did have potatoes, but not the real, real starchy potatoes like we get today that can like thicken a soup up. So we would use some seaweeds to do that. Da -da -da one of my kids favorites and one of the ones that I actually like get them to snack on pretty regularly is another seaweed called bladder rack. This one is the little puffy claw ones that you see all cling into the rocks when you go to the beach. It has like a little V shape to it if you can see that. I season those up and we dry them and my kids just munch on them like they're popcorn. It's one of the things that the few ones I've been able to kind of regularly get into their diet. think it's another good one. This one is called sumac and this is actually a plant that's really um, popular in Middle Eastern cuisine. They have a similar, it is a sumac, we have a native one here and we use like they do in the Middle East. It's a beautiful spice, it's very lemony. I make an Indian lemonade out of it and um, another one of my favorites, a really good sun tea. Oh, I think you guys are seeing me. Oh, that's okay. Alrighty. And then coming up in the summer, I don't have a lot here on the table because it's about that time. We have berry season coming. So these are elderberries. These are actually at the very end of summer, but I can't wait. It's berry season. And then I think that'll be it for the table. Uh, right now. I'll probably come back to that at the end. I'm going to move forward with some of the traditional plants that um, that I said I would highlight, how they were harvested, what they looked like, what we use them for. So I'm going to move forward with that. Well, okay, so the very first plant that I am going to be discussing is called Devil's Club. I'm not going to try and uh, pronounce the Latin name, but there it is for you. So Devil's Club is found um, in Oregon, Washington, all along the Pacific Northwest coast here. And then there's also this little kind of population that's over by the uh, Great Lakes um, in Canada, Michigan area. And you can see that on the map here. And this map is from the USDA, USDA plant database. This is a really great resource to go to, to kind of see where plants are growing and how to identify them. And they usually have some good pictures for you to use for comparison. So Devil's Club, as you can see here, is a spiked shrub. There's spikes on the stalk here. It's got a big, huge leaf that's like a maple leaf that has about seven to nine points on it. The spines run along the back of those leaves too. They have a spike on the stalk um, and ribs on the back of the leaves and the flowers are white and they, they turn into this beautiful red berry. And when you're walking through the forest and you see this pop of red, it is just beautiful. They can grow 12 to 15 feet high and they're found in moist woods, um, deep, wet, well-drained soil. You will, if you see Devil's Club, you know there's water nearby. It's in close by. 
So some of the traditional uses, and there's many of them. Um, one of the most powerful medicines for Native, it was one of the most powerful medicines for Native people, both spiritually. Oh my goodness, I'm sorry. Stop that. Sorry, guys. <laughs> one of the most powerful medicines spiritually and physically. It was burned for the ashes and used in ceremonies for paint. It was mixed with a grease, like eulican grease or bear fat, and used as paint for um, ceremonies. The ashes were also used for artwork. They were used in woodworking, staining, and they were for traditional tattoos. That was the ink. The walking sticks or the sticks were hardened and made into fishing lures and hooks. And then the sticks could be cut down and there's a little soft piece in the middle that could be pushed out and it would make a bead. And those beads were used for decoration in regalia and ceremonial dresses. So some of the traditional med medicinal uses of Devil's Club, it was used for rheumatism, arthritis, tuberculosis, to treat diabetes, burns, skin infections, sore throats, swollen glands, stomach pain. As you can see, it really treated a lot of different things. Constipation, nausea, it was used as a purgative. So it wasn't used to treat nausea, it was used to induce nausea. It was used as an appetite suppressant. And like I said, it was mixed with the grease and the ashes and not just for the pain, it was also applied that way um, as a salve was used in steam baths to reduce muscle and nerve pain. <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> it was used to have muscle and nerve pain, and it was also used as a deodorant. So here I have a couple of slides that show you um, some of the uses. So Nancy Turner is an ethnobotanist that traveled around the area talking to tribes about all of the different uses of not just Devil's Club, but she did do a really extensive uh, research on this particular plant. And this is just a sampling of what she found in Salish country um, for the uses for Devil's Club. So here you can see the Bellacula were using it, um, the Hidatsa, the Quaquiatl, um, the Seychelles were using it, and all of them had slightly different uses. Some, most of them included the arthritis and the rheumatism and the diabetes, um, but there was a diversity that was in there. And so here you can see there's like one, two, three, and like three pages of just, and this is not comprehensive of what she included in the paper. So the uses for Devil's Club were far and wide. It's also a powerful medicine for the modern world. It's an adaptogen which helps mitigate the effects of stress on the body. It helps treat insulin resistant type 2 diabetes which I mentioned before has really drastically risen in Indian country because of the shift in our diet. Due to its hypoglycemic effect, some people report a significant reduction in the need for injecting insulin when they use Devil's Club regularly. So how to harvest it. First, we need to know how it propagates so that we can properly approach the plant and make sure that we're harvesting it in an ethical and sustainable way. So Devil's Club actually has two ways to propagate. It sends roots out that shoot up from the base. So it goes from a root to a shoot and root to a shoot and it spreads out that way. And then also those bright red berries that I showed you, those bright red berries produce a seed. So animals and birds eat the seed, they digest it, they germinate it through their digestive tract, and then they discard it away from the original colony. So Devil's Club is typically harvested spring to fall, um, although I limit myself to doing it in the spring and then the fall. Um, so once it has buried, I leave it and let the birds have everything that they need and then once those berries are gone I'll start harvesting it again. So I'll do an early spring harvest and then a fall harvest. 
When you approach the plant, how to identify it and how to know what to pick, you're going to notice that there's a one large or a couple of larger plants in the middle. That one large plant is known as the grandfather and his father's or sons are outside of him and then his grandsons are outside of him. So when you look at the patch, you want to establish what generation is what before you even go in to start cutting. Now it's proper to always give an offering when we do that. What we're going to do is look at that generation and we're going to take just a little bit from each generation and then move to a new group. We don't over harvest from one group because it's a very slow growing plant and it has had an enormous loss of habitat. So there really isn't any place for it to go. Once we cut those spiky sticks down, what we do is we scrape those spikes off with a blunt edged, I use the back of a butter knife. The back of a butter knife, we scrape those off. And then there's a really thin papery leather bark that lays over the green bark that you're seeing here in the picture and we scrape that papery bark off. Once that papery bark, the outer bark is removed, we can peel the inner bark off of the stick. Once we've done that, it actually peels off really, really well, like almost like just peeling a banana. Um, it's really nice and uh, fulfilling. You're like, oh, here it comes off. Um, so once we get that off, and you can see that picture here, that's the green peeled inner bark. That's what we use for the medicine. So first we have to remove the spikes, then we have to remove the outer bark, and then we remove the inner bark, and then that inner bark is what we can use for our medicine. We cut those or break them up into little one inch pieces roughly, and we let it dry out. It just dries in the air three, five days, a pretty quick drying plant, which is amazing. And, um, and then that's the dried medicine. For roots, you can do the same thing. The root medicine is the more powerful medicine. And some people use the root exclusively. Some people use a co combination up. Um, um, here we go. So I went back so you could see, this is a picture of the root underground. And when I said that they grow up and they grow out and they grow up, it's that section in between between where you just cut that little piece of root out and you actually are able to allow both generations to still live. We just cut out the little connector piece because they've rooted down on their own. Okay, here we go. So once we have that dried material, we can make it into anything. It could be a tea, it could be a tincture, it could be a salve, it could be um, really those are the main ones, a water, water infusion, and I will briefly talk about the different ways to infuse. All right, so the next plant I'm going to talk about is stinging nettle. So stinging nettle is a like a superfood. It's, it's, it surpasses kale in its superfoodness. It's a member of the mint family. It's identified by having, it has a square stem like all of the mint family, and it has opposite situated sharply serrated leaves, and you can see in this picture they're very sharply serrated and they have stinging hairs on the leaves and on the stems. Stinging nettle likes to grow in meadows, thickets, stream banks, and open forests in low to mid elevations and it really likes disturbed areas. So when an area gets kind of tore up it'll be one of the first things that likes to come in. So the medicinal uses for <clears throat> nettle. It's an abundant source of minerals. It has vitamin C, silica, calcium, potassium, iron, and it contains just about more, uh, more protein than any other plant. Internally, it's a blood builder. It strengthens the lungs. It increases breast milk production. It nourishes the kidneys. It helps regulate fluid balance and muscle contractions and nerve signals. Externally, you can, excuse me, you can use it for pain and inflammation, for nerves, and it strengthens your hair and your nails because of that silica. <clears throat> for internal use, nettle is harvested in the spring before the plant flowers. The plant's cut in an angle 
and it's cut just above the first set of leaves. So you can see at least above the first set. I usually use a a, leave a couple sets. So here on the picture, you can see there are these little nodules and in this, these sections, you cut it at a um, angle. Nettle can be harvested throughout the summer for external use. The next plant I'm going to talk about is Salal. Salal, I say, is the unsung hero berry of the Pacific Northwest. <clears throat> it was one of our most abundant traditional foods in the summer, uh, berries, foods. Um, <clears throat> it's distributed all along the Pacific coast. You can see from California all the way up in and through Alaska and the Aleutian chain. It's characterized by its leathery, leaves and it's bright purple berries. It's an evergreen shrub and one of the most common understory shrubs in the Pacific Northwest. It prefers to grow in the conifer forest on rocky bluffs. We also find it along the seashore um, in low to mid elevations. It can grow up to six feet tall when it's in the shade and having to compete and reach for the sun, but usually grows to about three foot tall when it's in the, sun, in the sunlight. It produces edible berries and leaves that were a staple of the native diet along the coast. It, was one of, it is one of the most plentiful and important berries for coastal people. The berries contain two key components, tannins and anthocyanins. Both are correlated with the reduced risk of stroke, heart attack, neurodegenerative disease, and metabolic diseases such as type 2 diabetes again. So higher concentrations of both compounds are in salal berries than in blueberries, which that's one of the, these are some of the things that blueberries tout for being healthy, uh, but they're much more concentrated in our native salal berry. So the salal leaves are made into teas to soothe intestinal and urinary tract infections. They relieve diarrhea and you can do a gargle, a tea gargle to soothe sore throats and treat mouth sores. The leaves were used for their astringent properties to stop bleeding and dry wounds. And they were chewed as an appetite suppressant. And the branches and leaves were lined um, in our fire cooking pits. So the astringent properties, I have a little bit of a personal story on this one with the astringent properties. I have a special needs son who is a little slobbery. He just, he kind of drools a little bit. And um, when we're out in the forest, he loves to chew those salal leaves. And it just kind of, I think, dries everything up for him and he feels really good. And so he kind of on his own um, started using the salal leaf to help kind of dry that wet mouth out that he gets sometimes. So salal berries. Salal berries were consumed in many ways. The most common way was to be added with other berries, nuts, fats, and dried meats, and then pressed into cakes that were then dried or smoked. And those are often called pemmican cakes. There's lots of different names for them out there though. So the berries were actually also dried just for whole berry tea, um, but today they're most commonly made into syrups, jams, jellies, and fruit leathers. So slow has faced modern threats. It's used in the floral industry as an ornamental for bouquets. And so we have had people coming in, commercial pickers that come into our forest and harvest our salal for the floral industry. Now it is starting to, has been begun to be regulated by, um, by the state, uh, but there was a period of time where it wasn't and we were seeing some big losses in the Salal because of the, the floral industry. Now they're really starting to grow their own and, and relying less and less on the natural resource of Salal, but there still are people out there that are harvesting it for bouquets for the floral industry. So over harvesting is a threat to this iconic Pacific Northwest plant. Another threat that's really, really happening now, a current one with the Salal, is that in 2019, there were huge Salal die-offs in uh, the Pacific Northwest, specifically a lot of southern Vancouver Island. 
They really still don't know why the salal is dying, but they think it's possible that an unusually dry preceding summer and then a polar vortex the next winter was just too much for the salal to handle and that was what caused the die off. And so they are doing a study now and there's an early indication that the die off is potentially from climate induced change climate change induced changes. <laughs> so I'm not going to go into as much detail about this one, but I did want to give an honorable mention to willow. Um, it was a staple medicine in the um, traditional culture because it is a pain reliever and a fever reducer. And that's a really beneficial thing to have in your medicine cabinet. Um, so it acts a lot like aspirin. It's used for pain, including headaches, muscle cramps, menstrual cramps, rheumatoid arthritis again, osteoarthritis, mouth sores, gout, and much, much, much more. But I think the best thing or the most critical important thing about it is that it's a fever reducer. We, having a fever reducer when you have viruses and infections and things like that, that's critical. So this is our fever reducer. Um, this plant has been used in traditional medicine all over the world. Willows are globally distributed species of plant and they've been used in tra traditional medicine all over the world for centuries and centuries. All right, so we are at the, I'm going to stop share. We are at a little bit of a breaking point. Oh, where are we at? 540. Well, we have got to switch over to salve making. So I'm going to take like five, three minutes to switch over my space here. And I'm going to pull my salves in and, um, get going on it. So I'm going to turn off my camera so I can do like room change really quick and I'll be back in just a few minutes if Alani or Jonathan want to like jump in and maybe start um, getting questions ready we can start doing that kind of as I'm talking through. So I'm Okay, so this is Jonathan from the Connie program. Hi. If you would like to ask questions you're welcome to do so in the chat. Um, if you don't know where the chat is, it's right at the bottom in the middle of your screen. If you click on the little balloon that looks like a chat, that will open up the chat window either below or at the side of your screen. And you are welcome to, to just send everyone your question and we will, and uh, Lindsay will address them once she gets done. Um, also, while she's getting prepared, uh, we at Nakani would like to offer you the opportunity to hear, mo hear about more of our, uh, the activities that we're going to be planning. As Lindsay mentioned, we are going to have a, a, another lecture this Friday at 1 o'clock. Or is it 1.30? 1.30. Um, no, 1 o'clock, sorry. Um, and uh, we, we will certainly welcome your presence there. It will be a, some of the same material, a little different uh, uh, focus of it. But to receive, to get out to our mailing list and receive notice of other events, I'm going to screen share you uh, three questions that we'd, we'd also like you to ask, to respond to in the chat. So let me quick share my screen. There it is. Okay, so if you would give us your name, your email address, and any <coughs> affiliation you might have with the tribe, agency, or organization, uh, we will be glad to put you on our mail email list and you will then hear about other events in the future. Hi, and this is Ilani Casey again, and I just want to remind you that our email address is um, Nakani, N-A-K-A-N-I, I-N-F-O, Nakani Info at gmail.com. And we also have a website, which is www.nakani, N-A-K-A-N-I dot org. So make sure and check out our website and also uh, Take note of our email so that you can send this information. 
or if you have question, additional questions after this session. Thank you. And another activity that Nakani is carrying out right now is uh, some meditation sessions. Every weekday morning from 9 to 9.45, uh, if you go to our Facebook page, you will see a link to it. Uh, it is called Loving Kindness Meditation, and I've really enjoyed it a lot, so I invite you to join us for that too. And on the screen, you can see the um, how to make the uh, medicine. So it has the instructions. And um, Lindsay will be back to show you step-by-step step how to make it. Thank you. Okay, there you are. Stop sharing. I think no. No. Oh, you can't see my head. Sorry, guys. I had to fix it. Oh, sorry. Okay. okay, can everybody hear me? See me? I hope. Thumbs up, I see. Awesome. Thank you. Look you. good. You look good. <laughs> Thank you so much. Okay, so whew, I can't see my table. Yeah, yeah that, that's what we'll do. All right, so here we have my little salve table that I put together. Um, so what we start with is once we've harvested, so I'm going to show you some nettle here. I've got some nettle in the jar. This is just dried nettle. I showed you guys the recipe that is um, was up on the screen, but the truth is I don't actually use a recipe. Um, I have learned over the years to kind of just eyeball what I like. Um, and so I put the recipe up there for your benefit, but I'm not actually going to probably weigh things out or be that technical about it. What I usually do is just kind of add what I think is about is right. I've got enough experience now and just kind of let it go from there. But you can see what the measurements are or you could have seen and I will share that with Delani if people want to request a copy of the presentation or the recipes that they can use. So what we do is we take our dried herb, really this could be any of those traditional medicines that I've talked about. This one is nettle. And I just use food grade olive oil. Now I mentioned on that slide there are several different options. You can use jojoba oil, coconut oil, all sorts of sunflower oil, but I usually just use food grade olive oil. And the reason I use food grade is because it's actually regulated by the FDA. Cosmetic grade oils are not, and so I would rather have that little bit of extra guarantee that I know it's gone through some vetting, that it's not toxic for us at, at the very least, right? So I buy them in these huge jugs of olive oil and I really just fill my jar up until it's covered. 
Once I have it covered, I have my jar with my herb and I don't have it in here, but what I would do is I would put this in my crock pot. Now I would set it down in my crock pot sideways like this, and I would fill the water to about three quarters of the way up the jar. So most of the jar is underwater inside of your crock pot. Then I put my crock pot on warm. Now not low, we're not trying to cook these plants. We're just trying to infuse that medicine into the oil. So it's important not to put it on low and just to put it on your warm setting. Now that's called the fast infusion. The slow infusion, the traditional way would be to let it sit in that oil for four to six weeks in a cool place, not in the sunlight, and give it a good shake every couple of days. Now in modern day time, I mostly just use the crock pot. Eight to 12 hours in the crock pot. Um, you can go a little longer with some hardier um, herbs or barks, really, when you, when you have really tough material. You want to kind of maybe increase that time. When you have really light and frail herbs, you're not probably going to get much more out of it after that eight to 12 hours. And you may actually end up moving into that like cooking process. So after the oil, not going to be able to straighten, but after the, the jar comes out of the crock pot, it looks like this. It's very dark, and you can see the physical color change. I don't know if you can hold that up for me. The physical color change. The oil just gets rich and dark with all of the minerals and the vitamins and the medicine that's in oh, there. Oh. Okay. And what we do, and I'm not going to have time to do this part today, but I will show you, is all of this gets poured into what my grandma used to call a flower sack rag. And I just ball it up in there and twist and twist and twist and twist and get all of that oil out through a strainer in case anything pops through, you never know, and into a bowl here. And so what I have is all of my oil separated and strained from my medicine. Now that oil I pour into a pot, and that's what I have going here. I have a nice warm pot of oil. You have some good nettle oil. And this one sat in the crock pot for eight to 12 hours, and then it's been sitting on my counter for the last couple of days. So it'll be a really, really strong one. Um, once you have that oil though, I like to mix in some coconut oil. I just think it feels good. I love the smoothness of it. I don't always do it, but I will usually pour in about a quarter to a half of a jar for a full jar of medicine. Once I have that oil in, I just give it a really good mix. And really all that you have to do from here is get the beeswax in. Now the beeswax is what kind of solidifies it. Now traditionally we wouldn't have used olive oil or beeswax. Um, what we would have used is mammal fats. So mammal fats are solid at room temperature, much like a coconut oil is solid at, at room temperature. And so animal fats would be the ideal, the ideal medium to use for making a stab uh, traditionally. Bear fats are something that are still used today, but the seal fats, bear fats, eulican oil would, would have been really heavily used in this area, or the candlefish oil would have been really heavily used in this area for a traditional salt. But today we use the, the olive oils and the beeswax. So you can buy the beeswax two ways. I get these giant bricks, which is really the most cost effective way to do it, but it is hard to break these down and cut these down. And so I buy these, and I don't think you can probably see this, but I have this, uh, they're like little beads. And um, these just melt really fast. It makes it easy. So for today, I got the beads in here and I just pour my beads in. And I did give you the amount to use on the slide with the recipe, so you don't feel like you're just kind of going in blind like I am. 
I kind of know how to eyeball my quantities now. So I pop my wax in here in my oil. Now one thing I will note about the oil that's really important is you are not trying to make like hot frying oil here. You really want to keep the temperature as low as you possibly can while still being able to well melt your wax in. The hotter you get the, the oil, the more you're breaking down those medicines that you're trying to get into your skin and into your body. So once we have the wax in, we're going to give it a really good stir. Ooh, we need our testers. And so like I said, I don't use a recipe. So part of that is that I have to do a little bit of trial and error. So what I do is I put my wax in, what I think it's going to be, and then I take a spoon and I fill it up with a little piece and I put it in my freezer. And I wait like three minutes and kind of test it out and feel it out. And if it feels good, that's it. If it's a little soft, I add some wax. If it's a little hard, I add a little olive oil. And I go back and forth or, or coconut oil. And I go back and forth until I get that just perfect consistency until I feel like that's it. That's the one. And so they come out on the spoon and you want to be able to you know, raise your spoon up and have it not slide off. You want to be able to kind of still be able to get some of it though. You don't want it to be so hard that you're having to dig a fingernail in to kind of pop that out. And so that's how I do it with my little trial and error method. But if you follow the recipe, that one's pretty tried and true. It should work out for you. So once we have all of our wax mixed in, really there it's just putting it in containers. So a lot of the time what I use is I actually buy these online. They're the exact shape and size as an Altoid mint container. You can buy them on Amazon and so that's what I use because they're really good personal sizes. I make a lot of these salves and medicines for uh, giveaways within the tribal communities in the area. So some of these will go for canoe journey giveaways, funeral giveaways, naming ceremony giveaways, winter dance giveaways, things like that. And so I'll make a lot of them throughout the year with all of the different plants and they just kind of get given and gifted uh, throughout the year to different people. So once we have our oil in, we have our wax in, and we've checked our spoon or we followed our recipe exactly, now we just need to pour into our containers. Now this is actually the tricky part, right? Without making a mess anyways. And kind of hard to do on your own. It's kind of a, a little, I figured out how to do it on my own, but it is easier with two people because somebody has to hold a funnel. I've got a helper sister here. And then somebody needs to pour in. Now I have mastered funneling and ladling, but for today I'm going to use the help where I can get it. So really you're just going to take a scoop and you're going to pour it in. You're going to let that cool. Let it cool until it's solid. Don't close the lid until it's cooled. You don't want condens condensation in your cell. There really shouldn't be much moisture anyways because you've used dry herbs, but you know, better safe than sorry, leave that lid open. And then once it's cooled, you're done. <clears throat> That's the medicine. And so your skin is the biggest organ that you have. It is an amazing medium for absorption. And so this medicine, although you're taking it in externally, it is working its way into your whole body. So that is how we make ourselves. And one thing I think I would mention um, in this is that I used dried herbs. If you were to use fresh, which you can do, you just double the amount of oil for the for the um for the product or excuse me i said that backwards double the amount of herb <laughs> two times the herb for the same amount of oil excuse me and um the dried herb cell lasts for like one to two years and then if you were to do fresh it lasts like six months to 12 months 
So that's our demonstration on making our, our quick and easy uh, demonstration on making salves and, and medicines. Hey, Lindsay, someone is asking, uh, can you use whale blubber instead of the olive oil? Absolutely. And so whales, uh, marine mammals have that solid fat as well. That's, that's, so yes, absolutely, you could use whale blubber. Seal fat was one that was really heavily used traditionally. You know, we can just take questions now. If people, I mean, if you want to, you could maybe even unmute people, um, Jonathan, and we could take some questions. Sure. Uh, what I'd like to do is read the ones that people have already submitted. Perfect. Uh, we, we are not limited on time, so we should be fine. Uh, okay. Someone, some, uh, Lori is saying uh, she has a contorted willow in her front yard. It's very pro prolific. She's been pruning it a lot recently. Uh, would its medicinal qualities be much the same as other willows? Absolutely. Yeah, so the, the, the willow family, the Salix family, um, has all of those same medicinal properties. So that's not just constrained to our native um, willows. My dad has a non-native weeping willow in his yard, and I will sometimes harvest some bark from that willow. Cool. Okay, and someone asked, uh, are, are these plants available to be purchased somewhere to put them in your own yard? Yeah, there are many native nurseries. Um, you really could just Google it, quite honestly. Um, one that I can think of off the top of my head or a good place to start. Maybe just even something as simple as plant world, um, honestly. Okay. Okay, and the final question we've got from our chat is, uh, someone just wanted to clarify that you could use Devil's, Devil's Club and Salal to make salves also? Yeah, absolutely. And I make Devil's Club salve is, is probably one of the one I make the most, one of the ones I make the most often. It is really good for nerve pain and I actually have neuropathy. And so I use it to treat my um, arthritis that I have and the neuropathy that I get down my leg and my neck from that. Mm -hmm. So it's a really good nerve, nerve pain. I mean, it's muscle pain too, but it's specifically really good for the nerves. Great, thank you. Okay, we are at the end of our time that, that we'd agree to. Um, Yolanda, do you want to add anything at the end? Or, uh, yes. Do you, I want, just, do you want to conclude with anything? Yeah, I just wanted to say thank you so much for participating and listening, and we're so glad you're here. And um, don't forget to put your contact information in the chat and check out our website. And also, um, on Friday at 1 o'clock to 2.30 is another uh, another one of these Zoom uh, workshops that um, is with uh, Valerie Seacrest, and it is slightly different and some additional really good information as well. And we have another one that we're planning for June. So we'll uh, uh, keep you posted through Facebook. And thank you so much for, for coming and joining with us uh, this evening. All right, do we have one or two open questions at all or is everybody yeah, pretty well? Yeah. I think, are there any more questions, Jonathan? I think we checked them all. I, I just wanted to say thank you for a great presentation. Oh, hi guys, I see you, thank you. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah, Kashaka we just want to say, uh, We just want to say thank you as well. Yeah, and good to see you, Lindsay. Good to see you, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> hi, baby. <laughs> well, thank you guys so much for your time and kind of coming and hanging out with me this evening. I really am, was blessed to be invited to do this and I, I love, you know, sharing that knowledge and this is just, it was just a great opportunity. Thank you.